you very much for coming on this beautiful sunny day toward the end of the semester. I understand everybody's tired, low energy supplies at this point. Uh, we are very happy to host uh, Professor James Deutsch today uh, with us, uh, who uh, is the program's curator at the Smithsonian uh, Institute uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Jim has worked for the Smithsonian uh, for, for many years, which allowed him to develop and uh, do research within his primary fields of, of study. Uh, which is folklore, cultural studies, and film studies. He also taught in Wuch before, more or less exactly exactly 20 years ago, uh, right? And then kept coming back uh, to, to Wuch, so this isn't his first time here, either in Poland or in, in, in Wuch. And uh, he's a film studies specialist. He's a, Sociologist, uh, he's a folklore uh, studies specialist, um, and uh, he's also an inveterate uh, traveler for uh, scholar traveler. I, 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 I've seen uh, Jim unexpectedly in many places of the world. He's, you know. So at some point I thought, why not have him again in Wuch? So Jim, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. This is a, a, one of the guest lectures that we try to have within the uh, Institute of English. And today uh, Jim is going to talk about uh, divisions in contemporary American society. Thank you very much. Please help me welcome Professor Try this on. Yes, so it seems to be working. Yeah, so thank you, Casper. Uh, I'd like to thank my hosts, Casper uh, Bradshaw, Houston, or Fruzinska, who have made my stay here very comfortable. Um, uh, last night, ironically, I stayed at the conference center for the University of Wuj, which is exactly the very first place I stayed when I came to Wuj for the first time in 1996. And my hosts uh, then were uh, Vyeslav and Elspieta Oleksii uh, for the Department of American Studies and Mass Media. And based on that workshop I did in 1996, I was invited to come back and then taught for the academic year of 1997-98 uh, in a building on Narutovica, which is the longer part of the University of Wuj. But, um, so I'm happy to talk about this topic um, and I, I should say that I, uh, I have a series of slides that I'll talk about each one. Um, <clears throat> we will have time at the end for questions, but, but if you have questions during the lecture, if you have questions about something you see on the screen or something you hear me say, please don't feel you have to wait until the end to ask the question, because my feeling is if, if it's not clear to you, Maybe your colleagues may also not be clear. So it's better to bring it up at that time. So just, you know, raise your hand or start talking and we can address it then and there. Um, <clears throat> so the topic, you know, as we say, is the elite versus the people. And the word elite, uh, it's, not, it's not an English word originally. It's from the French, you know, with the accent aigu, elite. And it's a word that I think runs counter to what we believe in the United States. Uh, this is a page from the Oxford English Dictionary, and you can see that one of the, the earliest definitions uh, from 1848 uh, is talking about the, um, uh, the elite of the Russian nobility. And that's how we often hear the word used. You know, referring to this sense of nobility uh, and elite. Okay, yeah. Um, but, but as I'm saying, it's, it's not a word that Americans tend to be comfortable with, uh, even though, of course, there are different types of elites. But, you know, from the beginning, from the Declaration of Independence, uh, which was um, promulgated on the 4th of July, 
1776, that, you know, the famous words from the second paragraph of the Declaration, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a great word, self-evident. You know, this was the period of the Enlightenment. And, there, and the thinkers of the Enlightenment uh, believed that certain truths were self-evident. They did not need to be proved. They were self-evident. And that <clears throat> among these are the idea that all men, people, take a drink. <clears throat> all, men, <clears throat> all men are created equal. And that they are endowed uh, with certain unalienable rights. Again, this is kind of that Enlightenment philosophy. Their rights are unalienable. They cannot be questioned. And that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, we know, of course, that in the United States at that time, because of the institution of slavery, all men were not created equal. There was great inequality, particularly according to race and according to gender. But the belief, but the belief was that these were self-evident truths in this idea of equality. So that when the United States, after the 4th of July, declared its independence and fought the American Revolution and became an independent nation, uh, in our Constitution, again, there was this idea that there should not be any elite class. And this is from the Constitution. Uh, yeah, no title of nobility shall be granted. Uh, and no person holding any office shall, unless you have the consent, consent of Congress, accept a title of any kind, whatever, from any king, prince, or foreign state. So this was the idea in the United States. We are created equal. None of us shall be called prince or count or much less king, queen, or any title. We cannot accept titles. It's in our Constitution that we cannot accept titles. And so there's this belief that, again, we are all created equal. We are equal. There is no, there are, there are no aliens. Now, again, I'm emphasizing this is the belief that we like to believe that in the United States we are a classless society. We like to believe there are no elites. Now, and, and that we are one United States. This is an interesting point of, point of grammar for the linguists in the room. Uh, the United States today is a singular noun. We don't say the United States are. We say the United States is a country where everybody is equal. Grammatically, that's what we would say, but it was not always the case. And found this article in the Washington Post from 1887 saying there was a time a few years ago when the United States was spoken of in the plural number. The United States are, the United States have. But all of that changed with the war, meaning the Civil War. So up until the Civil War, the United States are, because the states, states is a plural noun. And it wasn't, I think, a, you know, an immediate shift. It was a gradual shift. But by the end of the Civil War, having fought that war, uh, North versus South, the consensus was the United States is. So again, it's this idea of unity, equality, no elites, no, no nobility, in, in terms of the belief. And this idea about the United States being one and individual is reinforced here by a speech given by former President Barack Obama. He gave this speech in 2004 at the Democratic National Convention. Um, he was one of the, at this time, he was a relatively unknown senator from the state of Illinois. And his speech at the Democratic National Convention um, attracted a lot of attention. And people saw him as a rising star in the Democratic Party. And eight years later, he received the, uh, sorry, uh, four years later, he received the nomination uh, to run as President of the United States. But his words then, I think, are quite important in terms of what we would like to believe 
Now remember, he's our first African-American president. Uh, and what he said is, there is not a liberal America and a conservative America. There is the United States of America. There is not a black America and a white America, Latino America and Asian America. There is the United States of America. We are one people, all of us pledging allegiance to the stars and stripes, all of us defending the United States. So this, again, this idea is that we are one. The, the motto of the United States is E Pluribus Unum, from the Latin, out of many is one. And that's, that's the belief that we like to hold dear, is that we are one. Without these divisions, without classes, without elites and other groups, at least that's the belief that we hold dear. But of course, that's not, it's not the case. And this is an article just happened upon from USA Today, which is a national newspaper, uh, published just a couple of weeks ago. Um, talking about Los Angeles and specifically the the Bel Air neighborhood of Los Angeles. So the title is, you know, where the mega rich and the dirt poor collide. So talking about extreme, great extremes of wealth uh, in Los Angeles and by extension throughout the rest of the rest of the country. That in this particular neighborhood, you have these incredibly large mansions. The one on the top is, is called The One. I think I have information. Yeah, so this is the mansion. It's, it's in the process of being built. Uh, it's very close to completion, but 20 bedrooms, seven swimming pools, parking for 30 vehicles, 9,700 square meters. And who's going to live there? Well, Who's going to pay $500 million to live in this one house in the Bel Air neighborhood? As we say, as I said, it's, uh, it's about to be finished. No one has bought it yet. But I suspect somebody will buy it. And uh, which, which brings me back to a little bit of kind of historical perspective. Uh, in the late 19th century, so from roughly the 1870s to the first decade of the 20th century was what was known as the Gilded Age. The term comes from the author Mark Twain, who used the word gilded because it looked like gold on the surface, but beneath the surface there was no gold, there was corruption. And if you look at kind of the the idea, the kind of the stories about the Gilded Age, it's it's like this cartoon and the ones I'll show you is there are these enormous, you know, fat, bloated capitalists. And uh, the, the words on them, you know, say about the, the steel trust, the copper trust, the railroad trust. There were these trusts and monopolies that were operated by people like John D. Rockefeller, who was head of Standard Oil, uh, Andrew Carnegie, who was a steel maker. Uh, Jay Gould, Jay Fisk, who were running railroads. These were, the, these were the elite. They were the financial elite. They were controlling the railroads, the steel, the oil industry, um, and they were corrupt. Uh, and in this, in this particular cartoon, the, the subtitle is um, The Bosses of the Senate. So this is the United States Senate, but behind them are standing the bosses who are controlling uh, the legislature. And you'll see this again and again in different cartoons. I mean, here's another one from the same period, and here the, the, the motto is that uh, history repeats itself. The robber barons of the Middle Ages, which is the one on the top part of the screen, and the robber barons of today. And again, it's the same image of, you know, these fat, wealthy capitalists wearing the, you know, the silk hats. Uh, and bowing before them are the people who are not members of this wealthy elite. Uh, and the first person we see is holding a sword, a sword that says legislation. 
and they're, they're offering tribute to the members of the Gilded Age, the, the wealthy elite. Behind them you see the, you know, the factory spewing smoke. So in spite of the promises of the Declaration of Independence, in spite of the idea that all of us are created equal, there was extreme inequality, great disparity of wealth in this first Gilded Age in the late 19th century. And then opposed to the, to the, uh, the leaders of the trust, who, the word that was also used to describe them was plutocrat, uh, a plutocracy. Plutocracy is government of the wealthy or by the wealthy. They were known as plutocracy and they were plutocrats. And in this, you know, labor versus greed, a warning to plutocracy. But the people who were primarily opposed to the plutocrats were at the time known as populists. And there was a populist party that was made up of farmers and industrial workers. And they forged an alliance in the late 19th century to try to defeat the rulers of the Gilded Age. Not always successful. Uh, but this idea of populism coming, you know, the voice of the people who were the, you know, the, the honest toilers on the farms and in the factories was this populist movement uh, that was opposed, you know, trying to control the influence of the, of the plutocracy. So right now, I think we're in the midst of a second Gilded Age extreme disparities of wealth. So Forbes magazine in the United States publishes an annual list of the world's billionaires. Um, anyone whose net worth is more than one billion dollars. And these are the top five. Uh, Jeff Bezos is now the world's wealthiest individual and actually Forbes published this list, I think, in March 2018. He's the president, founder, and CEO of Amazon, Amazon.com. Um, born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, his parents were not wealthy. He did go to Princeton, he got a scholarship to Princeton University, and he had this vision for starting an online shopping company starting with books. Yeah, Amazon started with books. He's the primary owner of Amazon stock, so his net worth today, and uh, yeah, so this came out in March. The figures I've seen, it's now up to $130 billion. I mean, that, you can't even imagine how much money, well actually I think, uh, yeah, his wealth is now equal to the wealth of 2.3 million Americans. I mean, how do you even comprehend that? I can't. 2.3 million Americans is the value of Jeff Bezos, who also recently bought the Washington Post newspaper. And has, uh, I have to say, I, I live in Washington, D.C., and Bezos has been you know, throwing a lot of money at the Washington Post to increase the number of reporters, to increase their coverage around the world. I have to say the Washington Post has become a much better newspaper thanks to Jeff Bezos and his 100 and whatever, something billion dollars. Second and formerly number one is Bill Gates, founder of Microsoft. Um, Bill Gates uh, came from a you know, middle class, maybe upper middle class family. He did, he did attend Harvard University, but he dropped out of Harvard after, I think, his freshman year to work on Microsoft. And through a series of, you know, strategic uh, initiatives, uh, he found a way to, mic to make the Microsoft operating system, the default operating system and all the new computers that were being built, and the rest is history, as we say. Microsoft became the leading software company. Number three, Warren Buffett from Omaha, Nebraska, has always lived in Omaha, um, and he runs an investment company called Berkshire Hathaway. 
that has been very successful. And you know, you you invest your money in Berkshire Hathaway, and your value increases for the most part. Uh, number four on the list is the one person who is not from the United States. Uh, Bernard Arnault uh, runs a company, a company of luxury goods called LVMH, which stands for Louis Vuitton Moet Hennessy, uh, based in Paris. Number five, Mark Zuckerberg. I think you all know who Mark Zuckerberg is, the founder and CEO of Facebook. Uh, and came from maybe middle class, upper middle class family in Westchester County. Like Bill Gates, he also went to Harvard. Like Bill Gates, he also dropped out of Harvard in order to work on his company. Moved to California and uh, has become very, very successful. Uh, only, yeah, only $71 billion in terms of his value compared to Jeff Bezos. And number 766 is our president, Donald Trump, whose value, according to Forbes, dropped uh, from the previous year. I think the, the, in 2017, his net worth was something like $3.7 billion, but the value has dropped, according to Forbes. I'm not sure what President Trump would say about that. He called, he called that fake news. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so Bezos, yeah, 2.3 million. Um, on this list are 2,200 billionaires. You know, we used to talk about millionaires and multi-millionaires. That is so 20th century. It's billionaires and multi-billionaires. And they're Combined worth, at least the 2,000 people on the list, uh, is 9.1 trillion. Again, these numbers, I don't know, 9 trillion is 9,000 billion, which is, you know. Anyway, the, the numbers lose, lose their meaning after a while, except you can say that their worth is equal to approximately half of the gross domestic product of the United States, which is the world's largest economy. Thought you might be interested also in, yeah, so, yeah, that uh, of, the, of the people, uh, of the 2,000 people on the list, roughly one-fourth are from the United States, but the others, uh, Greater China, which includes Hong Kong and Macau and Taiwan, uh, Germany, India, Russia, but California alone has 144. So that would include Mark Zuckerberg. I guess of the top five, only Mark Zuckerberg has California as his primary home, but he has homes. I saw his home in Hawaii a few months ago. I saw the fence <laughs> in front of his home in Hawaii. I did not see his home itself. But um, speaking of kind of the international billionaires, I thought you might be interested in who on the list is from Poland. Well, there are. Out of the 2,200, I found these five or six names, if you count both of the cool chicks, Sebastian Dominica, uh, Mikhail Soov. I don't know if they, are these names familiar to you? Okay. So these are the billionaires um, in Poland. And again, you know, for, and um, I should say that, you know, like, uh, you'll see that uh, Dariusz Miwek and Jerzy Starak uh, are both at, are both number 1650 because they both have the same value. So um, once you get once you get into the lower, you know, into the single digit billions, there are a lot of people who are who share the same net worth. So that uh, um, Forbes counts that number twice. But still, it's uh, you know 1.2 billion dollars is no small. All right. So, but I wanted to talk about how this second Gilded Age has affected contemporary American society. Uh, that you know, going back to this uh, previous cartoon, you know, it was labor 
in the form of industrial workers and farmers against the plutocrats. That was part of the first Gilded Age. What's, what I find very striking about this second Gilded Age is that um, there is no longer that opposition. So in fact, in the election, the most recent election in 2016 of Hillary Clinton against Donald Trump, you would have expected organized labor to support the Democratic candidate, Hillary Clinton. For the most part, they did not, or at least not in the numbers that we had been expected, expecting. So in this, in this article from a couple of days after the election, you know, organized labor is searching for answers after union households fail to turn out for Hillary Clinton despite a massive voter mobilization effort, a sharp departure from decades of union support for Democratic presidential candidates. So I'd like to kind of look more closely at that and ask the question, you know, why did the unions not support the Democrats in ways that they, in ways that they had. Now it does say, if you read that second paragraph, you know, Clinton outperformed Trump among union households by just 8%. So a very, I mean, Democrats did better, but not in the ways that had been expected. Um, and, you know, by comparison, Barack Obama won union households by 18% just four years earlier. These are, you know, people at a Trump rally. Uh, kind of the hard hat is a symbol of industrial worker. And saying, you know, I'm supporting Trump. I'm ready to work on the wall. You know what the wall refers to? The wall between the United States and Mexico along the southern border. This was one of Trump's campaign promises that I will build a wall and I will make Mexico pay the cost of building the wall. Hasn't happened yet. I mean, Mexico immediately said, what are you, crazy? We're not gonna build the wall for you, but this was one of the promises, and here's a construction worker, you know, presumably a union worker saying, I'm ready to work. The other sign you'll see, you know, the silent majority stands with Trump. It's a phrase from the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, people, people who were supporting uh, Richard Nixon in his presidential campaign of 1968. They were known as the silent majority. They were silent compared to the very vocal radicals or liberals, leftists at the time, but they called themselves the silent majority. But just to kind of recap what happened, in 2016, the red states there are the states that voted for Donald Trump, the blue states for Hillary Clinton. Uh, the states in the darker red are the ones that flipped from 2012, meaning they had voted Democratic in 2012 and they flipped four years later. And these are the states that made the difference. Uh, these are you know, states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Florida have a lot of electoral votes. And at the bottom, I've got the numbers. You know, you know that the election in the United States is determined by the number of electoral votes. It's not the number, the total number of popular votes. Because, in fact, Hillary Clinton received more popular votes. You can see the numbers at the bottom. She got 65 million votes, Donald Trump about 63 million popular votes. But what's important is where those votes come from, which states. And the way it works is each state, you take the numbers and then each state's electoral votes go to the winner. So Donald Trump received 304, and you know it wasn't even close in terms of electoral college votes. Because he won, this, he, you know, he won states like Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida, which have a lot of electoral votes. Actually, California has the most electoral votes of any state, followed by New York, and I think followed by Texas and Florida. Uh, but you, know, you can see where Trump got his support 
and a lot of support also from those industrial states in the middle of the country. Uh, you know, especially the states that, as I said, flipped from 2012 <clears throat> to 2016. Ohio, Pennsylvania, and traditionally democratic states. The other um, interesting numbers is looking, you know, dividing, looking at income as a determining factor. So um, for people with, on the lowest end of the income scale, people making less than 30,000, they went solidly for Hillary Clinton. You know, she got 53% of those earning less than 30,000. If you go into the next category, people making less than 50,000, uh, Clinton is still ahead of Trump. But it's the people then in the middle um, making more than 50,000 where you see Trump taking the lead. So for the next three categories of you know, 50 to 100,000, 100,000 to 200,000, and 200,000 to 250,000, um, Trump, is, Trump is running ahead of Clinton. Unexpectedly, I think. Now for people, you know, the, the extremely wealthy, you would expect Trump to win those because he's a member of that group himself. But it was not that far apart, you know, 48% to 46%. Now you know that the, the numbers don't always add up to 100% because there were other candidates in the 2016 election. Uh, Gary Johnson ran as Libertarian, Jill Stein ran for the Green Party, and they took, they took votes away from both Trump and Clinton, uh, but that's why the numbers don't add up to 100%. But, um, but this, this question of the people in the middle, and that's my next topic is, you know, so who are the people in the middle? Uh, what is the middle class? This is a fascinating observation, is that nine out of 10 Americans <laughs> think they're middle class. I mean, that doesn't compute, as we say. Uh, but based on surveys by the Pew Research Center is that the perception has remained the same. If you ask somebody, are you, you know, middle class or upper class or lower class, 90% and maybe it's, you know, the, the nature of the question. If you ask someone, are you in the middle or are you upper or lower, 90% are going to say um, middle, even though, as this says here, only about half of the households actually fall in the middle range, which is defined as yearly or annual household income. So that's not just individual, but how much does your household make ranges between 30 to $100,000 a year. Um, so even as, you know, even as more people are declaring themselves middle class, the actual facts are that the gap between the middle and upper income families is now the widest ever. And these are two different stories, the one on the top from 2014, the one on the bottom from 2017, uh, based on surveys, but they're saying the same thing, which is that the gap is growing wider, even though more and more people are saying they are part of the middle. But the gap of wealth is because, and you know, again, we go back to our earlier slide about Jeff Bezos and his 100 and something billion dollars net worth. That's what's accounting in large part for the gap. The wealthy are getting wealthier. Um, yeah, why do Americans believe they are all middle class? Again, it's what I'm, I'm saying is that they, they sort of have this idea, again, going back to what I said at the very beginning, all of us are equal. There is no nobility. There is no elite. So we all like to see ourselves right in the middle. And this goes back, again, this, this idea of upward mobility. Uh, these are two illustrations from the late 19th century. Uh, the book on the left is by Horatio Alger, 
uh, who was famous for his novels, which he called From Rags to Riches. And the idea is that anybody, again, this, is, this goes, goes back to those founding beliefs. Anybody can become wealthy. We all have equal opportunity, is the belief that was reinforced by Horatio Alger, you know, call it luck and pluck or pluck and luck, it's the same thing. Pluck means hard work. You are working hard. And the idea is that if you work hard, all you need is just a little bit of luck in order to reach the net, in order to climb the ladder of success. And this was, this is still the belief among people today. It's why there is why no one or very few people resent Jeff Bezos and his $130 billion. Because he's an example of rags to riches. He was born to a poor family in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And now he's the wealthiest man in the world. He demonstrated pluck and yeah, we can say he had some luck with Amazon. It became a very successful company. Mark Zuckerberg, pluck, you know, he had this idea for Facebook. And then maybe a little bit of luck in order to make him worth, what is it, $71 billion. Uh, but, you know, th um, this is what we often call the American dream is you can rise from rags to riches. You know, in a typical Horatio Alger story, you had a young man, hardworking, conscientious, working in the factory, earning, you know, pennies a day. Not even a dollar a day. Um, but he's honest, he's hardworking, and one day while walking the street, he sees a runaway carriage containing a young woman in the carriage. The horse, you know, for some reason, uh, the driver has lost controls of the rain, the carriage is running at top speed, at great danger to the young woman in the carriage. Our, our hero somehow stops the wagon, brings it to a halt, and learns that inside the wagon is the factory owner's daughter. That's the luck. He's got pluck, he's got luck, he saves the factory owner's daughter, the factory owner gives him a reward, he falls in love with the factory owner's daughter, they marry and he becomes a wealthy industrialist himself. These were extremely popular novels and magazines filled with stories like this, which gave hope to the people like our poor bootblack, um, that they too, could rise to become members of the wealthy class. And this is, you know, you'll, you'll see this throughout American culture in lots of movies. This is one of my favorite movies uh, from the 1930s, starring Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. It happened one night. It swept the Academy Awards. It won the Academy Awards for Best Picture, Best Director, who was Frank Capra, Best Actor, Clark Gable, Best Actress, Claudette Colbert, and Best Screenplay. And um, she's wealthy. She's an heiress. Uh, she wants to marry another rich man whose name is King Bagley. You mean his, his name, King Bagley, suggests he's part of this upper crust elite. She wants to marry him, but her father forbids her from marrying him because he thinks the guy is worthless, she runs away, and uh, she meets Clark Gable, who's a reporter who recognizes her as the heiress who has run away. He wants to get her story. Guess what happens? They fall in love, and they get married. But that's, you know, that's this idea of rags to riches. He's, he's in fact, out of work. It's during the 1930s Depression, but with a little, you know, with his pluck and his luck, he will marry the wealthy heiress. But it's this idea of, the, you know, always the idea is aspiration, aspiring to something greater. And I saw this recently in my favorite film 
from 2017 called The Florida Project, uh, filmed on location outside of Walt Disney World in Florida, filmed largely at this particular hotel, which in the film is called um, The Magic Castle. I mean, even the name suggests you know, something to aspire to. It's about young, young kids. Uh, on the right is Mooney, on the left is Jancy. They're about five or six years old on summer break. How many of you have seen The Florida Project? Has it shown? All right, well, just a few, but I highly recommend it. Um, it's beautifully shot in colors like this. Uh, it's the second film by Sean Baker. His first film, Tangerine, was filmed in Los Angeles about transgender people trying to eke out a living in West Hollywood. He shot it on an iPhone. People have seen Tangerine? No? You, all right. But um, the Florida Project, it's, it's about aspiration, uh, aspiring to be something better. And the hope, you know, I think Americans tend to be optimistic. We look at a rainbow and we think, gosh, there's got to be a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And I'm going to find that pot of gold. Uh, the people we see in the Florida Project are dirt poor. This hotel, the Magic Castle, is actually a welfare hotel where people are sent, you know, where they can live inexpensively that is subsidized by the state of Florida. Um, and it looks like their, their chances of success are very, very low or dim, but they have this hope that they too will succeed with a little bit of pluck, or you know, with pluck and just a little bit of luck, they will rise to the top. So speaking of rising to the top in a sense of aspiration, um, you know, here's our president who was famous as a, as a real estate mogul. Uh, he came from a wealthy family. His father was also involved in real estate, Frederick Trump. But in Donald Trump's idea of the world, he is one who, you know, climbed the ladder of success. Uh, because his father was pretty much based in New York City, owned a number of properties throughout the five boroughs of New York. But it is Donald Trump who developed the idea for these soaring Trump Towers. Uh, the one in the upper left is Las Vegas, New York City in the center, Chicago upper right, and then new developments in Brazil and India. Uh, but, you know, it, visually it represents this sense of aspiration, reaching out, you know, reaching, reaching for something golden into the sky. Um, which has become a very successful uh, idea. And Donald Trump, um, you know, going back to our Gilded Age and the second Gilded Age, I talked about kind of the tension between the plutocrats and the populists. And the, you know, the complete divide between the plutocrats and the populists. Donald Trump has found, has found a way to be both. He is a plutocrat. He's, you know, value at 3.1 billion, but he also styles himself as a populist. And this, for me, is what is unprecedented in American politics, that we have populists coming out of the plutocracy. And we'll talk a little bit about how Trump has done this. Part of it is this idea of, you know, his slogan, Make America great again. So you know, going past to the, going back to this golden age when America was great. He's, it's unclear, you know, what this time was when America was great. Whether it was the 18th century, 19th century, 20th century. But you know, make America strong again. Make America great again. I'm not sure when. America stopped being strong, but, but this is part of Trump's rhetoric, is this, you know, finding this moment in the past, reaching out and bringing that back. And that is a very appealing message. 
That is the populist message that Trump represents. Uh, yeah, so this is, I just wanted to compare the rhetoric of our two most recent American presidents. Here's Barack Obama. You know, it's, there are complete sentences. There's a logical flow to what he's saying. There are, there's kind of parallel construction. You know, much like all the great orators. You know, think of Martin Luther King Jr. I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. Repeating the phrase as, you know, it's a rhetorical style which Obama uses here. And then we can compare the rhetorical style of Donald Trump. This, this, is, um, this is an actual quotation. It was, it was even, uh, I don't know if you know the site, Snopes.com. Snopes.com investigates rumors or legends and decides whether they are true or not. And this was one of the issues that Snopes.com investigated. Did Donald Trump really say this? And the answer is yes, it's true. He said this on the 19th of July, 2016. Actually, it goes on for five slides. Um, where he's constantly, you know, there's no smooth flow of ideas. He's speaking in short sound bites. It's why Twitter for him is his preferred medium. You know, 140 characters is just about the right length. I guess they've increased the size now, but 140 characters. So he says, and, and he was asked a question about um, nuclear proliferation in Iran. That was the question. <laughs> so look, having nuclear. My uncle was a great professor and scientist and engineer. Dr. John Trump at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Good genes, very good genes. Okay, very smart. Warren School of Finance, very good, very smart. Um, there's no way to describe this, really. It's, it's complete uh, stream of consciousness. Um, and in talking about the genes, you know, he's Donald, you know, one thing that is consistent about President Trump, he is completely absorbed with himself. You know, narcissistic is not a strong enough word. But let's continue. So, very good, very smart. You know, if you're a conservative Republican, if I were a liberal, if like, okay, if I ran as a liberal Democrat, they would say I'm one of the smartest people anywhere in the world. It's true. When you're a conservative Republican, they try, oh, do they do a number? If you're a conservative Republican, you do. What's happened to the nuclear? Well, that's, you know, that's, is we've gotten off track a little bit. That's why I always start off, went to war, was a good student, went there, went there, did this, built a fortune. You know, I have to give my, like, credentials all the time because we're a little disadvantaged. We look at the nuclear deal, the thing that really, okay, the thing that really bothers me. We're back to the nuclear deal. Um, it would have been so easy, and it's not as important as these lives are. Nuclear is powerful. My uncle explained to me many years ago. <laughs> the power, that was 35 years ago. He would explain the power of what's going to happen, and he was right. Who would have thought? <laughs> when you look at what's going on with the four prisoners, now it used to be three, now it's four, but when it was three and even now, I would have said it's all in the messenger. He means the message, fellas, and it is fellas, because you know they don't. They haven't figured out the women are smarter right now than the men. <laughs> but the Persians are great. <laughs> The Iranians are great negotiators, so they just killed us. They just killed us. <laughs> now, this was recently in the news because he did, you know, he is going to overturn the deal that Obama made with Iran regarding nuclear non proliferation. So, this from nearly two years ago has suddenly become very timely in spite of his kind of roundabout way of, of getting there. So, but um, what I feel is that, is that Trump's style of rhetoric is extremely well suited for the people he's trying to reach. Uh, they understand him. They don't need the, the eloquence of Martin Luther King or Barack Obama. They don't mind the fact that he's, you know, going off track because that's how they talk. And uh, this was a, a recent episode on the Jimmy Kimmel Show. 
uh, asking, he sent a reporter out into the streets saying, can you name a book? Not, have you read a book? <laughs> but can you name a book? Now, what we don't see is, and I urge you to take a look at this on, on YouTube, what we don't see are the people who actually could name a book. What we see are the people who are completely clueless. They cannot name a single book. They could, they could have said the Bible, <laughs> but that didn't occur to them. One person does say he read The Lion King, <laughs> but then you know, kind of scratches his head and said, oh, I guess that's really not a book. Someone says he read The Jungle Book, but then says, oh, that's, I saw the movie, but is it also a book? Maybe it is a book. Anyway, it's, you know, at first it's, it's humorous, yeah, it is humorous, but then you, you begin to feel this is this is very very sad. That and these are young these are young there is, there's a range of ages. It's not just teenagers. Uh, there are people much older, including one who says she's a former librarian. <laughs> she could not name a single book. Now maybe camera shy. I don't know. But. Um, I mean, since this talk is for the Department of American Literature, I thought I should talk about at least one book. And it's a book that Trump has been compared to, The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. Um, so just, you know, in a quick internet search, I found, you know, uh, I'm not the first person to make the connection between Donald Trump and Jay Gatsby who, if you know the novel, you know, this is the original dust cover, beautiful dust cover, uh, called Celestial Eyes. And when the, the story is that when Fitzgerald saw the dust cover that Scribner's had designed for the book, he added a few words to the text he had written to make this all the more relevant. But, you know, so you know that James Gatz from North Dakota, uh, becomes Jay Gatsby, uh, and he has this dream that he will not make America great again, but make his life great again by recovering his lost love of Daisy Buchanan. Mm -hmm. And there's you know the scene of him standing on the dock, looking across the water from what is it East Egg to West Egg, and seeing the green light on the dock of where the Buchanans are living. And so I'll conclude with kind of the final, the final two paragraphs in The Great Gatsby that I think is among, you know, I'm a great admirer of Fitzgerald's writing style for people who read books. Uh, but, you know, Gatsby, and, and we can think about, you know, Gatsby and Trump because I am, I am making that parallel. So Gatsby believed in the green light. Again, that, that light that is, you know, that's the aspiration. Think of the rainbow in the Florida Project. That's also the green light. The future that year by year recedes before us. It eluded us then. But that's no matter. Tomorrow we will run faster, stretch out our arms farther, and then one day, dot, dot, dot. And so we beat on, boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past. I mean, Fitzgerald was a great style. I mean, picking words, you know, like ceaselessly, just the sound of it, ceaselessly, never ending. So, you know, that, that there is that green light is that it's a green light that also appeals to Donald Trump, uh, who, like Jay Gatsby, feels that he's not necessarily good enough. He has to keep trying. He has to keep running faster, keep stretching out his arms farther. And then one day, like the Horatio Alger characters, with some pluck and like, and one day, and so we beat him. That's why we keep trying. It's why... It's why people voted for Donald Trump, I believe. This belief that, you know, prosperity is just ahead. And if they run faster, reach farther, they too will achieve that American dream. Thank you very much.
So I'm happy to take questions or entertain comments if anyone would like to. Yes. A lot of things I would ask, but since you talked about Gatsby, and some of my students are here and are familiar with Gatsby, um, I, I guess I would see Trump as much more like Tom Buchanan uh, than Jay Gatsby. It wouldn't cross my mind that, uh, or I, I suppose I wouldn't use a word like aspirational to describe him. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm curious if you see him, uh, how would you compare him to Buchanan as opposed to Gatsby in the context of the novel? Uh, just as a, as a figure, because Buchanan's happy to brag about his mistresses. There's a kind of bravado, braggadocio behavior, uh, which seems more, which maps more with the Trump brand, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, yes, I, I would agree that you know, it, it, maybe in terms of personality, there are more parallels between Tom Buchanan and you know, the mistresses being one example. Uh, yeah, Gatsby himself is not is not a boastful character. In fact, when we first meet him, I mean, as you know, Nick doesn't even realize he's the host. But but I, I guess it's it's that it's that final dream of uh, of of the green light that I think is something that also is what is what is motivating Donald Trump. Um, and this idea of the you know reaching out to the orgastic future um, that I see the parallel, but yeah, I I, I I will agree that in terms of specific personality traits, uh, Tom Buchanan and Donald Trump have a lot in common. But I see it just in terms of the larger, the larger idea of again, I, I just love that idea of you know, and so we beat on boats against the current. I think that's Trump. He is a boat against the current, uh, very much so. And we'll see if in <clears throat> the next presidential election, um, we'll see what happens. Uh, again, you know, very few people expected Trump to win. I don't think Trump expected that he would win. I think. I think he wanted to improve his brand, the Trump, which is the Trump name, and running for president was one way to do that. Um, at first, you know, I, I think he wasn't all that happy. He complained that the White House, the building, was a dump. It's not, I've, uh, but he complained that it is. So I think at first he wasn't happy. I think now he's much happier in the job. And he's surrounding himself more with people who will say yes to him. You know, some of his early advisors were challenging his authority. Uh, so I think he's, he's come to enjoy the job more. Uh, yes? Yeah, just one more question about comments in relation to uh, the gas motif. Just, uh, again, I kind like of thought of that connection. Um, in fact, I think there is, at least to me, there would be a, uh, a reverse connection because it, it seems that Gatsby, one of the things he does is he overshoots Daisy's complexity. He seems to set too much stock by her, imagining that she's brighter, yeah. cuter, more intelligent than she actually is. And then you think about Trump and the way he deals with matters of policy, foreign policy, uh, recently ecology. And they seem to have a pattern of being uh, awesomely stupid and completely uh, bereft of any essence to the extent that when I listen to him, I can't sleep, I can't eat, I have uh, mental disorders, sleeping disorders, digestion disorders. I have gastric problems as well when I listen to him. And it seems that the reverse proportion is that where Trump, I'm, I'm just asking if this resonates with you, Trump seems to be uh, making complex things super simple to the extent that they are moronically simple. Whilst Gatsby makes things quite simple, super convoluted, and sets a little bit of mystique by them. Would, would you say there is a point to that? Uh, yes, I would agree. And I, I think this is also the source of, it's what, it's what makes Trump a populist, in my mind, is he, he does reduce complicated issues to, or he, he does try to simplify things 
bordering, as you said, on the moronic. I mean, his speech about the Iran nuclear deal being, yeah, you, you, um, but this is what connects Trump to his constituency. Uh, they follow his tweets. They retweet them. Uh, many of them, I think, are, you know, in, in my opinion, idiotic uh, and certainly not very thoughtful. But he, he has found a style to communicate with his supporters that is unprecedented. You know, in the, in the old days, you would go before a TV camera or, you know, newspaper reporters would take notes of what you're saying. Trump has completely bypassed that. Uh, he doesn't. He doesn't need the media. In fact, he he and the media have a very strong adversarial relationship. Uh, he calls CNN fake news. He you know hates the New York Times and the Washington Post. He you know barred the Washington Post from the White House for a, a period of time. And, and this resonates with his constituency because they share the same distrust of the media, who, who they feel are owned by you know people they cannot trust. And this again is this, you know, populism is, is this direct connection with the, pe with the people. Uh, so, you know, to get back to the title of the, of the elites versus the people, we've, you know, Trump has found a way that, as I'm saying, is unprecedented to link the two in a way that has never been done before, so far as I know. The, the elites um, is this uh, an, an American populism uh, and, and uh, the president's tweets is this kind of uh, aggressive uh, dislike of intellectualism and sort of intellectual history within the context of, of America, right? So, um, I mean, there was a New Yorker article a couple of days ago about the fact that Trump sort of has a team of people contemplating where to misplace a comma in the tweet uh, or a surprising capitalization uh, and that this kind of reflects uh, authenticity, right? That there's a careful construction of, of, of authenticity. So um, I'm, I'm curious, I mean, I, I suppose, uh, I, I wonder how you would compare some, some of these, these issues of, of frustration or kind of tribalism with somebody like uh, Nixon or Reagan versus Carter? Is it, is it so wildly different with Trump uh, right now compared to some of these past presidents? Um, or is it just the technology? I would, I would say it's a combination of, of the two. And you know, Trump often harkens back to Ronald Reagan, who was elected in 1980, defeating Jimmy Carter that year. Um, and part of Reagan's um, one of Reagan's slogans was "Make America Great," and so Trump is very much hearkening back to to Reagan. Uh, but I don't think either Reagan or Nixon had quite the anti-intellectual tone that Trump has, and I think that's a reflection of what we saw in Jimmy Kimmel. People don't read books; they can't even name a book. You know, it's not that they just don't read; they can't even name a book, and that's the people Trump is appealing to. So, yeah, I think I, I hadn't seen this referring about, you know, the capitalization or the comma, uh, but Trump's speech is um, authentically real for, for his constituency because that's the way they talk also. They don't feel the need to talk, much less write in complete sentences. Uh, it is the common vernacular, and that's a way that Trump is able to connect to the people, even though he is worth $3.1 billion. But his constituents do not resent that, I think, for two reasons. One is that they aspire to the same level of wealth, or maybe not the same level, but they aspire to reaching great wealth. And... Uh, um, they don't see him as a plutocrat. They see him as a populist because he wears, you know, he wears baseball caps. Uh, 
he talks the way they do. Uh, you know, that's, um, we all, I think you're familiar with the, the tape of Donald Trump on Access Hollywood with Billy Bush, where he said extremely crude and vulgar things. When, I, when the Washington Post broke the story, I thought, it's over, it's over. You know, who's going to vote for Donald Trump now? And it turned out, it didn't make a difference because people saw what he was saying in the most, you know, what he labeled locker room talk, most extremely crude and vulgar. They saw that as somewhat endearing. He's just like us. He's no better than us. He doesn't pretend to be better than us. And they're saying, we like that. You stand? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I want to ask you, what do you think about the argument that had Bernie Sanders been the Democratic candidate instead of Clinton, that he would have done better than Clinton? Because he was equally anti-establishment as Trump. In other words, there were some yes commentators right after the election who thought that maybe Clinton lost because she is identified as elite, and that perhaps Sanders had better chances. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes, I do. I do agree with that. I, I think that uh, Bernie Sanders would have done better than Hillary Clinton. And I think for you know uh, for a number of reasons which you which you've explained, you know Clinton was identified with uh, the status quo, more of the same, and I th people were looking for change in the election of 2016. Uh, a lot of people were looking for change, and Clinton represented everything but. Also, uh, Clinton is just or Hillary Clinton is not a good politician. She doesn't have that gift of connecting with people. Um, her husband is just the opposite. Her husband has an amazing gift of connecting. I've never met either of the Clintons, but I, I have talked with people who have, and they've told me that when you meet Bill Clinton, he has this gift for making you think that you are the most important person in his life at that very moment. He can do that. Um, Hillary Clinton cannot, and she seems very stiff, she seems inauthentic. There was the one uh, time she was captured on camera referring to Trump supporters as deplorables. Deplorable is not, is not a nice thing to say about anyone. And that reinforced this distance that people felt. You know, there's often this uh, index, I don't know if it has a name, but it's uh, which candidate would you rather sit down and drink a beer with? I, I think I first heard it in the election of 2000, George W. Bush and Al Gore. Which, you know, Gore was by far more qualified. He'd been vice president under Clinton. Um, but people felt he was artificial. You know, he spoke French very well. He came, you know, he came came from a uh, well. Actually, both came from political families, um, but somehow Bush was able to portray George W. Bush was able to portray himself as the kind of guy you'd rather have a beer with. And Bush won the election. It was it was very close. You know, it was the the hanging chads in Florida on the paper ballots that determined the outcome. But I think it's the same principle of Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. People felt more comfortable with him. They would rather have a beer with him. If it came down to Sanders versus Trump, I think it would have been much closer. And certainly the states of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, I think would have gone to Sanders. He was very popular in those states. Clinton did not campaign much in those states. And I think they proved to be the balance in the electoral college votes. Kasper? I have a question if you would agree that this uh, stunt or leap that uh, Trump has performed of bridging the gap between the plutocrats, the sort of elite of the rich and, and the populist has something to do 
with a sharp decrease and fall in the authority of, of learning education in general. Because when you look at such members of the elite as the Clintons, right, and, and Barack Obama, they, they, they were the, the, the elite, not necessarily by being very rich, but somehow they represented a certain idea, ideal or model of, of the elite. They aspired to a certain level of art, art, uh, being articulate, uh, uh, being learned, right, even eruditic. I mean, uh, you mentioned uh, Martin Luther King without, it's not an, it's not an accident, because there is this great uh, um, uh, tradition of how you conduct the public life. And Barack Obama uh, addressed this tradition. He became a part of it, right? Probably one of the uh, best uh, political orators. But Bill Clinton was in this, in this sort of camp, too. He published in uh, academic journals. I remember even when he was already president. Now, uh, uh, Trump is vocally, or maybe at least explicitly, uh, against this sort of uh, standard. He simply uh, deplores the standard itself. He, he lowers the standard by showing, uh, suggesting that it is um, not worth anything, right? So, in other words, that, that uh, success of bridging the gap, I think, I'm not sure if you would agree, comes from a rift within the elite. There is a rift within the elite. The, the former elite, let's say, uh, still aspires to a level of education. If you take Tom Buchanan, and it's, it's a good remark, I think, that he, that he shares many character traits, Buchanan, Trump here. Tom Buchanan quotes, what, the fall of the Roman Empire? What is it that he quotes? No, you know, well, that's and also the, it, yeah, the, the decline of the white race, I think, was exactly, one Exactly, right? Now, that would have never occurred to Trump, would it? I mean, probably not, because he, so, so he is elite, I mean, uh, the plutocrats, of, of the rich, which, but he's also a terrible populist in his uh, 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 deploring of, of, of education, simply, right? Which means that uh, the elite is changing. It's become, you know, they don't need it, maybe, at any point. Yes, um, um, I would agree with that, and that's kind of why I use the example from the Jimmy Kimmel show about people not reading. I think that is one of the defining elements of the 21st century is uh, people are becoming yeah. less, less educated or that the value of education is seen less and less, the value of reading is seen less and less, uh, and that you know, communication is handled in a much more direct and populist way, to me, is what I see as the developments uh, taking place. That that accounts for Trump's popularity at this moment. Now, and of course, many of us are hopeful that in two years, uh, the American electorate will see the error of its ways. Uh, but right now, there's, there's nobody on the Democratic side who we see rising to the occasion. There, there have been a couple of names mentioned, um, but uh, we're not sure that this, you know, Trump um, and the the, um, the polls, uh, the polls that are being done are, you know, showing that Trump's support has been has been increasing, or his popularity has been increasing. You know, pe people like the fact that he was talking tough with North Korea, and all of a sudden, North Korea expresses an interest in holding negotiations. They seem to be off for now, but they may come back. Uh, so people like that kind of taking charge. Um, so, I, I have a question about elite uh, in present-day United States because uh, uh, you've been talking uh, about American elite in terms of uh, economic success. In fact. But how about intellectuals, university professors, uh, uh, writers, do they have any impact of, uh, on, the way, on Americans? Because, you know, in Europe, including Poland, I think uh, th this kind of, this type of elite would also 
uh, matter, although they may not have much political power, of course. So, so, so what about elite like this? Yeah, I, I think the intellectual elite in the United States has very little um, influence on, certainly little influence on the American electorate and little influence in any sphere of, of public life. And, you, know, you, you think of uh, the word egghead. Uh, egghead was a pejorative term in the 1950s and 60s for someone with too much intellect. You know, their heads were large, which made them egghead. So Adlai Stevenson running against Dwight Eisenhower in the 1950s, Stevenson lost because he was seen as too much of an intellectual. And I would say the same happened in, the, uh, in this century with the elections of um, George W. Bush running against Al Gore in 2000 and running against John Kerry in 2004. Uh, Bush was anything but an intellectual. Uh, Kerry, even though he'd gone to Yale, uh, like his father, uh, Kerry had gone to Harvard, Gore went to Harvard. So, I mean, they're all, but, but somehow Bush was able to convince the voters that he was not an intellectual. And that brought him more votes, I think. So it's, it's completely contrary to what you would find in, in many places in Europe where having some intellectual capacity is seen as a virtue or a benefit. In the United States, it's often seen as a liability. You're too well educated. You talk in ways that confuses the voters. Um, and go back to our 92nd uh, speech by, not speech, but commentary by Donald Trump. That's, I think, what is more appealing to voters. And he, you had a question before. Well, I was just going to ask, you know, where, where should we look for reasons for the changes that have taken place in the American society? Because uh, uh, while there is this anti-intellectual uh, trend, uh, in there has always been one in, in, uh, in America, in the, in the United States, but there was also a time when high school education was valued, right? And uh, average people did read books. Where should we, you know, what, what happened? Why, why is anti-intellectualism, uh, uh, you know, um, prevailing at the moment? Yeah, that's a great question, and I, I don't have a, yeah. I don't have a, a good answer, um, except to say that I think, you know, as you suggested, there's always been a, a strain of anti-intellectualism in the United States, and I would say that it, you know, it ebbs and wanes. Or, increases and decreases from time to time, and we're at a moment now where it's, it's less and less valued. Uh, and I'm, I'm honestly not sure that I can explain it. You know, people often talk to uh, kind of the, the medium, kind of the media of communications, and uh, uh, the internet is where most people get their news today. They don't read newspapers, they look at their news feed on Facebook. Uh, or Instagram, or um, you know, that's where people are being educated, or they're looking at you know popular videos on YouTube. Uh, none of which are what I would call great intellectual platforms. Um, but it's 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 often you know too easy to just blame the media because you know, in my one of my favorite media philosophers, Marshall McLuhan. And I taught a course on mass media with Professor Ale in Professor Alexi's department. You know, his his statement was the medium is the message. Uh, that the medium itself does not give a particular uh, point of view, but it it is the message itself. And the medium of television is very different from the medium of radio or the medium of print. And the medium of the internet is something new, which we're just, I think, beginning to understand, or maybe not even beginning to understand. We're still trying to figure out what is the meaning? What is the message? 
of the internet, where you are connected uh, virtually in millions of ways simultaneously. That is a new medium. And whether it's making us less intellectual, I think we'll, it's not possible to say at this time. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and on that note.